Hello everyone. For this presentation, I'm going to share with you the experience I've had in setting up the stroke unit at Steve Biko Academic Hospital. The journey wasn't always that easy, but in the end, the fruits of this endeavor has been plowed and it definitely has a sweet taste. So according to the World Health Organization, most people living with HIV and AIDS reside in Sub-Saharan Africa. It has been noted that the prevalence of stroke has increased over the last couple of decades in these developing countries, with potential causes of stroke in HIV-infected individuals include, amongst others, opportunistic infections and infections leading to a secondary vasculitis. So I will start with the first experiences that I've encountered with the stroke patients at some of the outlier tertiary hospitals in our area during my internship. These hospitals are severely burdened with patients. They have a lack of resources, ranging from IV cannulas up until actual TPA medicine itself. So during these training years from my internship up until community officer years, you are basically brought up with the opinion that there are not really anything that we can do for our stroke patients. What is done is done. The damage has been made and rehabilitation is not even worth it, as these patients will most likely succumb to complications way before the time of recovery. Most of these stroke patients don't even get admitted to the hospital setting due to the beliefs around their management. So most of the trainees do get some sort of exposure to activate the stroke treatment, maybe virtually via Zoom sessions, stroke training sessions, or whilst doing the American Heart Association ACLS course. But in practice, activating a stroke code and administering thrombolysis is almost never realizes. So the unfortunate consequence of this is that this belief carries over into all our areas of the health system, not just in those resource limited areas. So then I started with my training as being a neurologist, prepared to take on the world of hyperacute strokes. I was then faced with some disbelief. At most, I managed to administer thrombolysis to around five cases per year. The door to needle time in these five cases were around two to three hours. And this really was just what I didn't expect it to be. So just to highlight the mortality and burden of cerebrovascular diseases in South Africa, this is a table published in Stats SA. And as we can see here, vascular diseases account for the second highest impact on morbidity rate in South Africa, just next to infectious diseases. And then as we look at the subcategories, cerebrovascular incidents account for the fourth highest cause of mortality. So how is this possible? Why are there only five cases per year eligible for acute stroke treatment? Well, most of the times it was blamed on the patients or even the system. Patients taking way too long coming to the hospital, patients being unaware of the importance of stroke, patients trying to sleep their symptoms off before they try to get to a hospital, they're not having transport, EMS taking their time in transporting the patients, the system being limited by the resources. Now I think we've all heard and experienced these factors, and I don't question the validity of this reality, but only five patients receiving TPA per year, so there must be something horribly wrong. In the back of my mind, I knew exactly where the root of this problem lies, and it stems from the stigmata that nothing can really be done for a stroke patient. The damage is done. We cannot help these patients. We will never be able to activate a stroke code, get a CT scan, give the medication within the noted time frame of 60 minutes, according to the American Heart Association, not even mentioning that there are also complications for administering TPA, like severe hemorrhages. So we rather play safe and don't take these risks. So in any case, the team at Steve Biko and Califone conducted a study at the hospital sampling 140 stroke patients, respectively, trying to analyze the risk factors in stroke patients. Interestingly, we identified 140 patients for the study, and surprisingly, about 30% of these patients managed to present to the hospital within nine hours of stroke onset. 15% of these patients presented with an acceptable range of four and a half hours of stroke onset. And then, how many of these patients received thrombolytics? Zero. Shoo, so what just happened? 30% of stroke patients presented within the time frame? Why were these stroke patients not identified and treated? Again, we can say that there is not just a lack of access to resources that play a major role here. There is also this limited awareness that stroke patients can be managed. Stroke patients typically have a loss of functioning. So they don't complain, they don't yell, they don't even move. So there are not really an urgency for our healthcare professionals to identify and treat these patients. 
And then there's obviously no interdepartmental communication. So what if the triaging professionals identify a stroke? What now? There is no stroke code. Getting neuroimaging is almost an impossible job in such a short, specifically in such a short time frame. Speech support doesn't even divert your call to the radiologist within the allocated time. So I think this picture in this slide nicely depict this type of system that I was that I'm speaking about. So we, what we can see here that only once this message has passed through all of the departments, a lot of time has already passed. So this is a nice article published in the South African Journal of Radiology done by our colleagues at Wits University that demonstrated that the median door to imaging time for stroke patients were averaging about eight hours since the patient was first identified in the triaging area. So what is happening here is not new. Stroke centers in the first world countries undergo the same problems. So I came this, across this really interesting concept that is referred to as the hedgehog concept where the fox knows many things, but where the hedgehog only knows one big thing, and he knows it really well. And this is from an ancient Greek parable. So what this parable describes is that every day the hedgehog goes on to gather some food. The fox, on the other hand, will try to catch this hedgehog for a nice supper. And every day this fox will try to a, new, a couple of new tricks in order to catch this hedgehog. Nevertheless, the hedgehog only knows one trick. And that is to curl up into a bundle to allow his spokes to bear off the fox. And by doing this, every time, the fox fails to catch the hedgehog. So by using the simple but effective strategy, the hedgehog gets to win over the fox who is using many tricks to catch out this hedgehog. And this is one thing that we have to learn from optimizing stroke care for our patients. We have to be more like the hedgehog. Follow a simple strategy and be effective in implementing it. This brings us to the goals of stroke optimization. And by these primary goals, we can see that the minimum requirements were warranted by the American Heart and Stroke Association for an organized stroke unit setup stipulates that we are going to give TPA, we will at least need a designated stroke team. It must also be offered to at least 50% of eligible stroke patients within 60 minutes and 50% of the cases within 45 minutes. As we can see, these are pretty, really pretty lofty goals. And mo most the recent data coming out from the, from the US, where they've collected data over more than 150,000 patients of more than 10 years, show that these are obtainable goals. Now, it is even considered a norm to have a dorsal needle time of less than 20 minutes. So this is the data that was published in Stroke March this year. And by looking at the time from 2003 to 2018 and comparing that to the percentages of patients who are treated within one hour, we can see that about 15 years ago, less than 20% of patients were treated within one hour. And currently 60% of patients are treated within 45 minutes. So what this has done can be seen by looking at the outcomes of disability scores in the bottom of the slide. And here we can see that they are now achieved an outcome for the patients which are with disability scores that is just as good as what they had before they had a stroke. So what do we need to achieve these goals is having a stroke unit that is operational 24 hours a day, seven days a week, providing a service that can treat these patients very effectively. This is a nice table defining the different differences between being a stroke ready, having a primary stroke hospital or being a comprehensive stroke center. And from this table, we can see that the majority of our tertiary hospitals can serve as being part of a primary stroke hospital. So let's look at the typical setup of these hospitals. And the way that I'm going to do this is to break all of these factors down into a pictogram so that it becomes easier to understand this process that we have to simplify, like the hedgehog. So here is a patient that have had a stroke. I will discuss some of the modifiable interventions that we as neurologists can do to facilitate treatment in these patients. So then this patient is brought to the hospital via via relatives or via the EMS. And we now know that about 30% of stroke patients do arrive within the allocated time frame. These patients are then either triaged as being, as, as being either very urgent, urgent or not. Like already hinted to, this becomes quite problematic for our stroke patients because they don't make a lot of noise. Therefore, they're typically not helped very quickly, resulting in the biggest delay to treatment. 
So once this triaging personnel have flagged the patient, by this time the patient is out of the treatment time window. But let's say you have one of you are one of these five patients and managed to have been identified in a timely manner. What next? Now the emergency physicians get called. These guys will then have to quickly confirm the stroke like picture and then speak to the on call radiologist who is already overburdened with plenty of booking cases. Formerly, renal functioning was requested. Um, which is erroneously indicated to be cleared before contrasted scans are ordered. So this automatically disqualifies the stroke patients due to a delay in getting the results. UNEs have an average turnaround time of around six hours. So that's if we have a lucky day. In the rare incidents that a stroke patient did complete this pathway and received neuroimaging, a high care bed should now become available to assess the vitals for continuous monitoring as well as an infusion pump to administer thrombolysis. So due to the extensive um, price tag of TPA, most of the time it's locked away in a special cupboard. So finding the keeper of the keys takes an average of 20 to 30 minutes. If a high care bed does open, the altar place is prepared and the patient has managed to get through this pathway in the allocated time. They miraculously get the medication. So as we can see, this is a very effective system that has, has many tricks to help a lot of different patients. It is effective, but not for stroke patients. So instead of trying to change the tricks of the system to adapt to a new system, we rather have to simplify it to a new one, a single stroke line. So in order to do this, we're going to have to have a triaging system, the emergency physicians, as well as the radiology department. A simple, uncomplicated, well-educated and equipped pathway should suffice for this. So accessibility and the administration of the medication shouldn't be limited by bed availability and long search time for the keeper of the keys. Again, a simple, well-equipped, readily available system should fix this delay as well. So as I alluded to, let's first look at the patient factors that we can optimize to improve stroke care. Majority of these factors need community-based awareness programs. But what we as a hospital can do is to extend the time window for treatment because if we can bump this requirement up to 9 hours, include wake-up strokes as well as strokes of unknown onset, we can treat 30% of all our stroke patients. So I want to elaborate about this specific population group of unknown onset or wake-up strokes. In the past, we typically would have only admitted them for further stroke workup with secondary stroke prevention strategies. So the thought now is that the tre these treatment strategies should be aimed at the amount of detectable mismatch on neuroimaging. This mismatch can be defined in several different ways. It can be defined as a small core but with a larger area at risk. It can also be defined as a mismatch between the core and penumbra through DWI flare MRI imaging. So one of these trials, the Extend IA trial, the majority of patients were enrolled using CT perfusion imaging. These patients were enrolled in up to 9 hours from stroke onset. 65% of these patients awoke with symptoms. In this study, they found that a majority of patients in the altar place group had a functional outcome that was free from disability. So having a modified ranking from 0 to 1, compared to only 30% in the control group. These findings were statistically significant. From this trial, they deduced that the infarct core should not be, not be too big, less than 70 mils, as well as having a mismatch ratio or core to penumbra ratio of 1.8. So with this in mind, I quickly want to show you the history of CT perfusion scan. And of course, I'm going to tell you about the results of the first ever trial, which was published about 12, uh, 12 years ago. So this is the patient that was included in this first ever trial for CT perfusion. And as we can see, we have a 77 year old female who suffered from a left MCA stroke with proximal occlusion. But at the time, about 12 years ago, they didn't perform as many interventions as we do today. So they actively included her in this randomized trial for thrombolysis versus placebo. So in this situation, we can see she had a nice penumbra on the perfusion imaging CT and got thrombolysis 13 hours after going to bed. A CT scan was performed 24 hours later, which revealed that she had a very small final lesion on the MRI, as well as having a nice recanalization of their MCA. So from this single case, we can see that she had a both effective treatment but of course, also a little bit of luck as well. A three-month month modified ranking was one. 
to the combined results of this trial was the following. That there were twice as many good outcomes with thrombolysis than without, but the number of patients included was only 12, 6 who received the thrombolysis and 6 who did not. So from this trial, it was concluded that the doing a CT perfusion imaging with late onset thrombolysis was feasible, possibly effective, but of course, much larger number of patients were required to make this generalization. So let me quickly just remind you of the three principal concepts that change the guidelines for delayed onset stroke management. And it comes to measuring core and penumbra or showing this mismatch ratios. So the one that was most familiar with is the core penumbra mismatch, which is based either on CT or MRI perfusion imaging. Then there's this concept of core to clinical mismatch. That is again here, we measure the core by perfusing a CT a perfusion imaging, and then we estimate the penumbra by the fact that we say that the patient has quite severe clinical deficits. And these quite severe clinical deficits is clearly larger than the core that we can see on imaging. So in other words, the deficit must be related to the penumbra. And then the third concept for measuring some kind of mismatch is the famous DWI flare mismatch that we see on MRI imaging. So I think as we know, these different concepts have been used in clinical trials for IV thrombolysis. The core penumbra mismatch has been used in the Extend IA as well as in the diffuse trial for endovascular treatment. The core clinical mismatch concept has been used for endovascular, wake up and late presentations for up to 24 hours in the dawn trial. And then of course there we, we have the IVI thrombolysis based on a, upon the MRI DWI flare mismatch that occurs within four and a half hours. That, that was conducted in the wake-up trial. So as we can see, we have different concepts, and as we know, we can use these concepts, which are all evidence-based. In fact, all of these trials showed positive evidence. So as we can see here, for example, in the thrombolysis group with CT perfusion in the Extend IA trial, the meta-analysis showed that the half of these patients were wake-up patients, which were the same for the endovascular trials. The other half of these patients constituted out of strokes of unknown onset as well as strokes that occurred within nine hours of onset. So comparing CT perfusion mismatches to MRI DWI flare mismatch, we can see it is just as good as well. It is important to remember that these two mismatches are measuring different things. DWI flare mismatch is actually measuring a kind of clock system. That is, it tells us that the stroke has happened within the last four to five hours. And this replaces the, really this time mechanism, which was previously considered to be the gold standard. Whereas perfusion imaging has less to do with a clock, it has more to do with tissue viability. So it is supposed to tell us whether the tissue is already dead or salvageable. And of course, some patients may have a lot of dead tissue very early on, and others may have a lot of penumbra very late. But as you can see here, you cannot just say it's the same thing. It is really two different kind of things. The one is apples and the other one is oranges. And we cannot say the one replaces the other. So based upon this literature, these new recommendations were added to the 2019 guidelines for the management of acute ischemic stroke, saying that alteplase can be beneficial if the time of onset is unclear or greater than four and a half hours from last known well, or who have a DWI flare MRI mismatch imaging that is smaller than a third of the MCA territory and no visible signal changes on flare. It also includes the perfusion-based imaging criteria, where the minimum amount of tissue at risk of infarction should be a mismatch ratio of more than 1.8 and a, having a core that is not too big of less than 70 moles. So the biggest hurdle here was to facilitate communication as well as to address some of the medical myths regarding stroke and imaging. So the first medical myth that existed and posed a threat to perfusion imaging was caused by a reluctance in imaging stroke patients urgently with that possibility of causing contrasted associated renal failure. Initially, stroke patients who only received imaging once the urea and creatinine clearance results were available. The current NHLS lab turnaround times averaged about anything between 6 to 24 hours, which makes acute stroke treatment virtually impossible. So this was a meta-analysis of 14 studies published in stroke. They demonstrated that the importance of neurons over nephrons exist. And in this meta-analysis, they assessed 5,727 patients into two groups who received contrasted-based CT angio or CT perfusion studies. 
they concluded that CT angio or CT perfusion are not associated with a statistically significant increase in risk of acute kidney injury in patients with a stroke, even those with known chronic kidney disease. So the second myth that was need, we needed to dismantle that prevented timely based neuroimaging acquisition was this relationship of contrast to iodine allergies. As we all know, iodine is a normal trace element in our bodies. It is not and cannot therefore be an allergen. Exactly how seafood allergies and iodine allergies became linked is unclear. So both fish and shellfish do contain iodine. However, it's not the iodine that's the source of seafood allergies, but rather a protein called parf albumin and forms of tropomyosins, which present in these specific seafood that is the source of this allergies, mediating an IgE antibody reaction. So next, the theory of excess radiation exposure in CT perfusion images had to be addressed, although I found somewhat alarming stats, but it has nothing to do with neuroimaging, and I will share this with you now. So for CT perfusion, a contrasted bolus of 40 mils is administered via power injector rate at 7 mils per second, followed by a saline chaser of another 40 mils at the same injection rate. The contrast used should typically be as high at a high concentration, ideally around 330 to 3670 grams per deciliter of iodine. The image acquisition begins a few seconds after this injection, and protocols are designed to acquire one image per second for 90 seconds. A potentially problem with this, however, is that extending the scanning time can increase the patient's radiation exposure. One solution to this problem is using acquisition parameters at 80 kV rather than the more conventional 120 to 140 kilovolts. This kilovolt setting would reduce the administration of radiation dose to the patient. Okay, so to put this into perspective, um, an actually acquired head CT on a standard 64 section volume CT scanner typically has a 3.2 um, um, effective radiation dose. For comparison, the background radiation for a person living in Boston for a year is approximately three, or about that of one standard head CT. So the radiation dose of one image a second single bolus standard CT perfusion image is approximately 3.7, which is slightly more than one, uh, slightly more than that of one standard head CT. So unfortunately for the people from Johannesburg, this prof professor Christopher Busby reportedly found that radiation measures were as high as 8 millisieverts in Joburg, Johannesburg per year. So every person in Johannesburg is exposed to approximately 3 CT perfusion scans per year. Okay, so we all now know that perfusion scans are a functional way of, of examining the current hemodynamic state of the brain. And the main purpose of these scans are to detect the ischemic core which is damaged infarcted brain and to differentiate this from the penumbra, which is the hyperperfused but salvageable areas. So these are some of the parameters that you will come across by when working with perfusion imaging, namely cerebral blood flow, which is the volume of blood passing through a given amount of brain tissue per unit of time, cerebral blood volume, which is the volume of blood in a given amount of brain tissue, as well as the mean transit time, which is the average time that red blood cell spends within the determined volume of capillary circulation. Time to peak is the length of time to reach peak density. So these are all traditional parameters. You won't see these parameters often in contemporary studies, but I'll explain to them to you now. So some of the modern day publications typically refer to Tmax or time to maximum of the residual functioning which is the day, delay of arrival of conscious medium into the brain from its time of administration plus half of the mean transit time. A permeability surface or PS product expresses the damage of blood brain barrier and extravasation of contrast medium into the surrounding tissue. So looking at the analysis software packages used for these defining these different thresholds for core and penumbra, we have Philips, Siemens as well as Rapid. So this sounds like a simple process, but it's not. I attended multiple courses, had virtual patient demonstrations, attended online lectures, and participated with our own software cases before the first patient presented to us. 
When he arrived, I still remember this clearly. I thought I would just find his values, but with what I was presented with, identify the cutoff norms and give the TPA. Then to my horror, the results looked something like this. So I had to go back to the drawing board, never realizing that each of these different software packages have different values. So you really have to master these values in order to interpret these findings. So here I'm going to show a summary of these findings what the, and what they exactly mean. So here we have the brain and the squares represent the given tissue. Here is a blood coming in from a vessel and it's going to fill up this volume of brain tissue to a certain extent. So we have the blood that is coming in and that to a certain cerebral blood flow. And this is going to fill up the tissue to a certain cerebral blood volume. So it took a certain amount of time for me to draw this blood flow coming in from the vessel and filling up the volume. And the time it took me to fill up this volume until it reaches its peak is called the time to peak. And then eventually the blood is going to leave that volume through the venous system, which we can see here in the picture. And now let's look at one blood cell as it travels through this pathway. So we can see here that this blood cell is going to come in to the tissue and as it's now going to hang around in there for a certain amount of time, perfusing this tissue until it finally exits. So the mean time that blood cell would spend from coming in from the blood vessel and floating around is referred to as the mean transit time. So for comparison, let's say on this side the blood flows in. And the on this side, the tissue is dead or dying. So it's not going to hold much blood because this tissue is not viable anymore. So in other words, there's going to be less blood that fills up this tissue and less blood is going to exit. So this tissue would have a low cerebral blood volume. So this would, similar to be, would be similar to DWI on the MRI imaging. It reflects that that tissue is not viable anymore. So if blood flows in very slowly, so in other words, the cerebral blood flow is reduced and it doesn't fill the brain tissue up that very much. So the cerebral blood volume is also very low and reduced. It took a long time just to reach this point. So the time to peak is also prolonged. So the time it took for this, that little red blood cell to hang out in the tissue before it left through the veins was also prolonged. Therefore, the mean transit time was also very high. So because the cerebral blood volume was low, which matches the cerebral blood flow, therefore, cerebral blood volume represents the core. The tissue volume has been decreased. In other words, the cerebral blood volume represents that non-viable tissue or necrotic dead tissue. And we can see this on the CT perfusion imaging. Okay, so now let's have this tissue fill in up again. And this time it's going to fill in slowly again. So the cerebral blood flow is low. But even though the cerebral blood flow is low, it's still going to fill up to a normal volume. So here it took a long time to fill up, but it did fill normally. So the cerebral blood volume was normal, but the cerebral blood flow was low. And the time to peak took a long time. So that was elevated or prolonged. And if we would follow that red blood cell, we would see that that little cell hangs, a, uh, hangs out quite some time around this tissue for a long time as it makes its way through the tissue being fed by the collaterals to exit, meaning that the mean transit time is also going to be prolonged or high. So tissue matching these parameters are still viable by having reduced flow, but still a normal volume. So this is referred to as salvageable tissue or the penumbra. So we have to pay particular attention to these mean transit time or the time to peak, as these are the most sensitive parameters in detecting ischemia. Cere so cerebral blood flow might be normal, but if the time to peak or mean transit time is increased, that suggests ischemia. 
So what we might have here in this situation is where blood flow is coming in. And it's go again going to fill up slowly. But in one area, the blood volume becomes normal. But in another area, this blood volume is reduced or abnormal. So in this case, in the periphery, we have normal cerebral blood volume, a decrease in cerebral blood flow, and then increase in the mean transit time, as well as the time to peak, because it took a long time to fill up this volume, and the blood cell will take a long time to complete its journey. And this is what the penumbra will look like as opposed to the center, where we have low cerebral blood volume due to necrotic brain parenchyme, low cerebral blood flow, as well as a mean transit time and time to pick, which are both prolonged. And this would be the core of the ischemic infarct will look like. So, in this case, we have a perfusion scan. In the top right corner is a time to peak image, where we see this very large area of an increase in time to peak which corresponds to this large area of increase in mean transit time. Cerebral blood flow is decreased in this area here as well. Up here, we can see the cerebral blood volume is mostly symmetrical, except for a few areas where there's a decrease in cerebral blood volume, notably the left putamen and around the caudate and corona radiata. So this corresponds to an area of smaller infarct wall represented by the decrease in cerebral blood volume with a large penumbra in the distribution of the left MCA. Again, the penumbra is represented by the prolonged time to peak as well as mean transit time as well as the cerebral blood flow, which is prolonged or increased. So looking at the vendor-specific perfusion scans, according to this article in the stroke, RAPID has the highest precision and good accuracy for defining these values. Philips software was more restrictive in their values, and Siemens significantly overestimated the hyperperfused volume. So, newer software packages like Rapid AI calculates the Tmax value, which roughly equates to the mean transit time, but certain patients maintain a cerebral blood volume for significantly longer periods of time because they have good collateral supply, and this is referred to as the slow stroke progressors but patients with poor collaterals can reach a decrease in cerebral blood volume at a much earlier state, and these are the fast stroke progressors. So being able to identify a slow progressor is really important because these patients will benefit from thrombolysis at much longer period time intervals, even extending over 9 hours since stroke onset. So now what happens after these patients have been correctly identified? Neuroimaging has been performed and the contraindications excluded. So we still need a special dedicated area for stroke care or a place where we have access to an infusion set, vitals monitor and easy access to TP administration. And how do we facilitate communication between all these departments while maintaining a simplified algorithm? So this is where our stroke trolley comes in with a simplified algorithm that needs to be followed. On the stroke trolley, you will find the necessary vitals monitors, a rapid INR analyzer, a glucometer, infusion pump, a tablet with a stroke app installed on it, as well as a TPA and the necessary emergency drugs and protocols. There is a small pantled zoom camera located on the top of the trolley, which is used as a two-way communication device, allowing access for telestroke. It is equipped with an alarm that sounds when the code is called. In other words, it makes a louder noise than most of the polytrauma patients drawing attention to the stroke patients. So as you can see here, this protocol that we have to follow is divided into two sections. The green section, which will highlight the main buttons that which should be pressed on the iPad, on the trolley. In other words, it is a shortened version of the stroke algorithm, which is represented in the blue section. The stroke application serves as a quick step-by-step -step protocol measuring all the critical points in the stroke pathway. So this trolley is equipped with two iPads with a stroke application called ActFast. This serves as an entry point to quick input of patient information, which is then sent to the radiology department and the alarm is sounded at all the respective departments. Therefore, the whole clocking system is bypassed and the patient can be directly transferred for neuroimaging. imaging. So the stroke alarm is quite a formidable sound. 
So when the code is activated, it's difficult not to manage a stroke patient. It is typically only used or activated when the healthcare per personnel fail to respond in time. Then there's a physical green line that has been drawn from the entrance where the stroke trolley is located up to the radiology department. It is approximately 50 meters long. Once the code has been activated, the patient is not allowed to deviate from this line. This was initially quite a problem as most of the stroke patients got lost in the ED on their way to the scanner. The, re the exact reason for this still remains elusive. But because most of these patients are so severely incapacitated, they might end up going for vital checks, ECG monitoring, etc. and then get shifted into the mainstream patients, only to be seen many hours later. So what about managing patients over a tilt-pan-zoom virtual camera? In the US and Europe, there are now this popular shift to managing stroke patients virtually. So it's easy to find a virtual-based telestroke hospitals that manage stroke patients over large areas. They manage usually 15 to 20 hospitals with telestroke medicine. This even became more popular during the COVID pandemic. So this is the first publication dating back as far as 99 on telestroke care. And in this article, they emphasize the importance of time in resource limited areas. So how this works is the moment the stroke code has been activated an alarm is being sent out to the neurologist that is on call, they can log in via a web-based pan tilt zoom camera to assist the patient remotely, facilitate communication to the emergency physicians, as well as to the radiology department. This makes it possible to provide stroke service 24 hours per day, seven days a week. So recent data published around a meta-analysis regarding the safety of telestroke in an in-person treatment showed outcomes that were more or less the same as to that compared to face-to-face -face in acute medicine. So looking at the quality of care in telestroke, this is a statement by the American Heart Association in that telestroke is one of the most frequently used and rapidly expanding applications of telemedicine. And by looking at the best practice and recommendations of stroke management, they've already incorporated telestroke since 2017 into their guidelines. And they state that treating suspected patients with stroke with an acute thrombolytic therapy in hospitals is safe and quick. It is now considered to be part of standard of care. And then lastly, providing positive feedback to the whole emergency team who manage these patients are of utmost importance showing the patient outcomes and what role everyone has in the patient's outcome provides a remarkable results. We also have a scoring board in the ED demonstrating the door to needle times and their records. At this time we have an impressive door to needle time of around eight minutes. So looking at some of the results that we were able to obtain this year, this feedback is provided by the rescue database. So since the start of our project, which was launched in January, we've already managed 125 patients. The average age of our patients are significantly younger compared to that the age of other institutions in the country. The patients that we see tend to score slightly higher on the NHIS disability scales compared to other facilities. At this stage, 23% of all our stroke patients meet the criteria for thrombolysis, which they receive. Our average door to needle time came down to an approximately to an impressive 15 minutes, beating the rest of the country. So I'm proud to share that Steve Biko Academic Hospital has been the first hospital that has been awarded diamond status for being stroke ready. And with this, I will conclude my talk and I hope everybody enjoyed listening to it.